Welcome into hour three of Overdrive. You're watching on TSN 2, listening on TSN 1050. I am Aaron Karolnik in for Brian Hayes here in our Scarborough, Ontario studios. Jason Strudwick out in Edmonton, Alberta. Jamie Noodles McLennan. Wait, Columbus, Ohio Noodles? Yes, Columbus. Columbus, Ottawa tomorrow. I know you'll be watching. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I did watch yesterday the Pittsburgh-Ottawa wow. game, which was actually, that overtime was ridiculous. Unbelievable. Back and Unbelievable. forth, back and forth. Uh, Drake Batherson yeah. scoring the winner. And what was your vibe like with regards to when well, you spent a lot of time with the Sens, but Pittsburgh in town, eh, it's probably not so positive over there. Honestly, though, it was... Because it's March break, it was an absolute full house. Like there was not an empty seat. the The building was rocking, even though it was a low scoring game, but it was still high event. Both goaltenders played really well. Um, you could tell that Pittsburgh was pushing. They they you know they're eight points out of a playoff spot, so they really needed those two points. You're scoreboard watching. You're watching Detroit get woodshedded. That being said, Buffalo I think is now five points out of a playoff spot and kind of you know, sniffing around. Like, I think it's going to be very interesting heading down this stretch here. Yeah, you know, teams trying to leapfrog each other. A couple couple games in hand on Tampa. Detroit, like I say, has stubbed their toe. Um, you know, Philadelphia, that's a big game against the Leafs tomorrow because they're not out of the woods. They've got 76 points. And, you know, Joe from the bridge has put up the, the standings there. I mean, this is Washington playing at Edmonton tonight. They've got 19 games remaining. Like, it is... It's going to be, you know, right down to the end. Jersey's got the two new goaltenders, so I don't know. I, where's the cut line for you guys? Is it Pittsburgh? Is it is it Buffalo? Is it Detroit? Like, where where is the cut line for you guys? Ready? I'll, I'll jump in there. I, I I I don't have the faith in Pittsburgh. I've now seen them no. play a, quite a bit recently. I I just don't think they have have it this year. And it's not even their top guys. It's just the general team. So. You know, New Jersey, I feel like they made the move for the goalies too late or unable to make it earlier. Um, so I think that, you know, five, six points is exciting, but there's a number of teams in front of you. You have to pass, you know, Buffalo, Detroit. I think we'll find a game. Uh, it sounds like Larkin might be back probably not this weekend, but next, uh, sorry, not this weekend, maybe next week. So I don't yeah. know. I, I probably cut it off noodles at, at, at Buffalo, probably. What about you, yeah. Aaron? Yeah. Well, I mean, I would say, and I hate to say it because our boy Travis Konechny joined us earlier, but I would not be surprised at all to see Philly fall out. And you know, the Sean Walker trade, again, I was there on Saturday night where Tampa just destroyed the Philadelphia Flyers. Yeah. And I actually really yeah. liked what Tampa did with Duclair and Dumba. I thought both of which, both of whom mm. looked really good uh, in that game. I could see Philly yeah. falling out. I think Detroit will turn it around. Larkin comes back. And you have that swoon. You lose six in a row. I feel like a turnaround is almost inevitable. And the Islanders have been really impressive here over the last couple of weeks. You look at their roster construction. Patrick Waugh behind the bench. They've got a stud goalie in Sorokin. I like their D. They've got some yeah. forwards up front that are game breakers. Maybe that's a team that I won't call them the Florida of this year. But if I was to identify anyone that was kind of on the outside looking in, and I don't think I would consider Tampa simply because of their pedigree and everything that they've accomplished over the last five years, 10 years. But maybe the Islanders could be a sneaky team here down the stretch that an opponent would not want to face one of the top teams in the East. Well, and, and to jump on that, they're a pain in the ass to play against. Like the Islanders yeah. have like that fourth line. They play hard. They're physical. They, they, they really clog things up. Like they they play a playoff style hockey in in november on a tuesday night like that's just how they play you know so i i think you, you you've got some players that have kind of pushed through this noah dobson's a player right so oh. you know they've got some guys on the back end that are a little bit more mobile the goaltender is a rock star although he's been up and down this season but i i i think they are a team that you circle and go god i, I just don't know if that's the team you want to try and beat beat four out of seven i think you can but you're ice bagging because they they are going to make you pay for it and and you know that's where they when they play for keeps it'd be interesting because there is going to be potentially a Cinderella story you know it's not always just hey top teams roll through and that's it there's going to be one team that we're sleeping on that goes man these guys are on a heater or on a run and I don't know which side it's going to come from well and I'll ask you this new guys when you when you look at the Islanders team. 
it's they they I don't think they're a shootout kind of group, right? They they don't want to have a high scoring game, so they want to try to keep it relatively low. But yeah. if if are they are they able to for seven games for multiple rounds just keep as you say grinding out the wins, goaltending and 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 good D men and then pretty responsible forwards. It feels like that is their way their path forward. That's a really hard style to play, but I, I you know for for a long time over the year in, in the playoffs. We'll continue this conversation a little bit later this hour, gentlemen, but we have a man on the line who's a former NFL head coach, a former college coach, a former NFL DB, now with ESPN. It's our man Herm Edwards back on TSN 1050. Good evening, Coach. How are you? I am well. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time. There was news about an hour ago that broke that stunned the football world, Herm, in that Calvin Ridley chose to sign with the Tennessee Titans, a deal worth as much as $92 million, $50 million of which is guaranteed. And there was a bunch of speculation that it was Jacksonville or New England. How do you think Ridley ultimately ended up in Tennessee of all places? <laughs> well, well, the one thing about this, this free agency, um, you know, we speculate that players could end up here or there, but until they sign... You, you basically don't know. Now, obviously, obviously, the agent had a lot to do with this, and I think the player. You know, eventually it's the player's decision where he wants to play, and I think he felt going to Tennessee, uh, a team that is, uh, I think, on the rebuild, really. Um, you know, that was 6-11. and 11. It's interesting. Uh, it's a division where it's, uh, you know, the Texans, a uh, young football team last year, won that division. Jacksonville is is, is very is, is, you know, is a good team. And, and the Colts, obviously, with Richardson, uh, they were 9-18. and 18. They lost him early. So it's interesting that Ridley chose to go to Tennessee. Herm, Kirk Cousins cashes in, and at 36 years mm-hmm. old, you know, does the addition <laughs> of Cousins make the Falcons a, a real contender in the uh, NFC? Yeah, I believe that. I think when you look at the Falcons' record last year, um, you know, they dabbled at the quarterback position with numerous guys, and, and, and obviously that was one thing that uh, they talked about this year when the season was over with how can we fix the quarterback position, uh, whether it was in the draft, obviously, or in free agency. And, and that was kind of a, a head-scratcher that Kirk Cousins decided to leave Minnesota and go to the, um, to the Atlanta Falcons with Raheem Morris. Now, I think if you're Raheem, you're excited. And the fact that you have some, some players on offense, B. John Robinson, Algier, um, you know, uh, uh, Patterson is, is, is a big-time player. You have Drake London. Uh, you know, you have a good tight end at Pitts. So, all of a sudden, this team that was 7-10 and 10 last year, 3-3 three and three in the division, and it's the NFC South. You know, it doesn't take a lot of wins to win that division. <laughs> They're right there. I mean, they won – you know what I'm saying? They, they won seven games last year playing musical chairs with the quarterback. I say this. You just acquired Kirk Cousins. He's going to win three more games for it. So now all of a sudden you're 10 and 7. Herm, how do you like uh, the fit for Saquon Barkley with Philadelphia Eagles? Uh, I, I think it's a good fit in this sense if they use him correctly. Um, you know, he, he's not only he's – he's a dynamic runner, but people don't realize how good he is as a pass catcher. Um, you know, he had 41 receptions last year. He had, you know, he, he touched the ball for the Giants almost 300 times, um, carries and, 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 and catching the ball. I think it's a good fit for Philly. You know, Philly's a team that likes to, to run the football. That will help them. That'll take some pressure off Hurts. Um, I think how they use him is very important. But, the, but, but they got to they gotta find a way to put this offense together because last year it struggled and, and really – the main thing that really got them, I thought, was their defense. Their defense was 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 not very good, guys. I mean, it just it was poor, to say the least. ESPN NFL analyst Herm Edwards is our guest here on Overdrive. Justin Fields had a really nice end of the season, coach, with the Bears, and a lot of people were thinking maybe he could be the future at the quarterback position, in spite of Chicago having the number one overall pick. Now that doesn't appear likely at all. Seems like the Bears will be drafting Caleb Williams. So where do you think that leaves Fields here? And it doesn't seem like there's an ideal landing spot for him to be a starter. Is it possible he stays in Chicago? Maybe looks to be traded somewhere where he could take a backup role. What would you advise Justin Fields to do if there was really something he could do? He is under contract, but still. Well, obviously, 
he's not going to stay in Chicago. I mean, that's, 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 that's no, you're not going to stay there. I think he's got to look at some teams, obviously. And I think here's the, the critical part for him. Is it a team that when you look at it, uh, an older quarterback there or a younger quarterback there, that's not the important thing. It's the offense that they run. What offense can, can, can he uh, obviously play well in? And, and that's going to be the key for him once he leaves. You know, what structure and, and what system will allow him to come in and maybe compete with an older quarterback or with a younger quarterback? And this is not over by any stretch of the imagination. You know, he's just kind of sitting there. And I know for him, he wants to make a decision. Um, but this thing will – it'll weigh itself out, and we'll see what's happening. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, I look at some teams here, and I just kind of scratch my head. And I go, hmm, might be interesting if he went here or, or this other team. Or, I, I, I. What if he went to San Francisco? Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Back up 30. Uh, Right, I mean that's true. I'm just saying. I mean, I you know I I'm not saying that's where you're going, but I'm saying it's stuff like that. Sometimes we don't look at and go, "Hey, where could this guy go?" Let me ask you this: Could he go so to the, the Giants? It's true. So the Chargers make a, a big splash in the off season and sign Jim Harbaugh to uh, a long term deal. Um, being a former coach yourself, how do you think he's going to fit with Justin Hebert? Oh, he's going to be, he's going to be excited. And I think the first thing he's going to do, he's going to restructure this whole team, what it looks like, especially offensively. They're going to run the, they're going to run the ball, guys. I mean, this, yeah. this is going to be, a, 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 you know, this is going to be a, a two uh, chin strap game when you play uh, the Chargers <laughs> going forward defensively. Cause they're going to run, they're going to pound it. They're going to play action. He's going to control the clock. Um, he'll get that defense going. This is going to be a tough physical football team. They'll be really good on special teams because that's, that's his M.O. That's what he believes in. You know, that's what he preaches. And so I, I've said all along, I mean, this is a team that's been talented. Uh, but when you look at them, guys, last year they were 1-5 in, in the division. 1-5, in five, right? They were 5-12. and 12. They have enough talent. If they can just figure it out, they should compete with the Chiefs every year. So Harbaugh is going to get this thing flipped. They're going, they're going to be pretty good at it. Herm, it feels like the New York Giants have been trying to redo their uh, offensive line for, I don't know, it's been a long, long time. They, they made some changes. They've tried to draft. Do, do you think it's just that simple to give any quarterback behind that line some success? Yeah, and, and, and that's going to be the key now. You know, they, they're going to stick with the quarterback. Um, you know, I, you have to, obviously. Um, but they've got to get some, 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 some players around him that can make plays. Guys, their best player got in a cab and drove an hour and ten minutes to Philadelphia. He stood down <laughs> That's their best player. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry. I shouldn't say cab. He Ubered it. Oh, yeah. He Ubered it. <laughs> and, and, um, Excel. And, guy, I mean, you know, this is one of those deals where – you scratch your head. He's your best player. The guy that's playing for the Eagles now. He just left. So if you're the Giants and you're going to stay with the quarterback, I give you paid him. I get all that. But you got to get him some guys around him. Uh, some skilled players. Obviously, you mentioned the offensive line. But this is a team that I mean, this is the Giants, guys. And then they haven't they haven't been very good in the last couple of, couple of years. Herm Edwards is our guest, ESPN NFL analyst. Uh, Herm, I want to put you in the shoes of New York Jets head coach Robert Sala, who may very well have a 40-year-old quarterback in Aaron Rodgers campaigning to be the v- vice president of the United States of America. <laughs> what do you think is yeah, going you know on? Only in America. Only in America. <laughs> what do you think is going on I'm right now? In in that we building, won't that part of it. <laughs> like in the in the Jets building right now, they're seeing these reports. Do you think they're reaching out to Rodgers and being like, uh, "Dude, you know we kind of need you. We traded a lot for you. Basically, the entire franchise rests on you playing quarterback for us." Like, like, do you think there's any well, legitimacy no, no, to what's going on here? No, he's going. He's going to play quarterback. Aaron Rodgers is going to play quarterback before he even becomes a politician. If that's what he chooses to do after his football life. I think Aaron Rodgers is a guy that he's very competitive, 
and what happened to him last year, he doesn't want to end his career that way, right? And I think if he comes back uh, to this football team, um, that gives him some hope. You know, defensively, they were very good. They were the third-ranked defense in the league. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, they, they have the potential to play really good defense, but offensively, they were just they were atrocious. So I think with him back, they, they've got to get him some protection. You mentioned the offensive line because he's 40 years old. And um, he's not going to scramble a whole lot. He wants to sit in the pocket and throw the football. So they have to do something uh, to, you know, beef up that line and invest there, whether it's in free agency as well as in the draft. Coach, always a treat to have you as part of this radio show, this radio station. It's great to have you back, and let's do this again soon. Thank you so much. My pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you. Always. That is Herm Edwards from ESPN. Yeah, this Rogers story. He wow, never fails scary. to keep himself in the news. And you know what I was thinking about more so than anything? This Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is getting all this free publicity for his campaign. Simply by mentioning the name Aaron Rodgers, everybody <laughs> yeah. is running with it all yeah. across the country. I guess, I right. mean, all across the continent, I guess us included here, but it's just so preposterous. And even Herm was, Herm, Herm knows what's going on, you know, with the U.S. political yeah. system, just nodding his head. He's like, yep, sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I'm not getting into that either. No, yeah. no, no, I, I don't know. I, it is, it's just so weird, but I wonder, this is what I always wonder with a guy like Rodgers who's got, hundreds of millions of dollars in in the bank but he just seems to always be in the news cycle once a month like yeah. when he retires what is he going to do for that attention what is he going to do for that adrenaline rush because if he retires at 40 or 41 years old what are you going to do for the next 50 years if you want to live till you're 90 like what's next for Aaron Rodgers that's what i always think about when guys retire you know, a lot of them have money. They have a lot of things. You know, they got family, they got kids and stuff. But what are they going to do? Is there going to be another career? Or are they just going to lay on a beach? Are they going to golf? They're going to, like to me, Aaron Rodgers, if he wants to be in the news cycle once a month, he's going to have to be doing something. So be interesting to see what this guy is going to be up to you know, a year after he retires. Well, you, you take Rodgers out of the equation. I mean, he's made ungodly sums of money. Both of you guys, pretty quickly after you retired, made your way into hockey media right like strutty like how long after you you hung him up were you hosting radio and doing your dinner television program as well yeah very popular show by the way um yeah <laughs> i took a break i uh, went dominated hockey in the second division in sweden uh, for about six months then i came back and i started up right away but you know what for me and noodles makes a good point like i i wanted to be busy and active i have a very young family um yeah sure i stay in shape and i'm learning to play tennis but you know you want to be active you want to have something going on just say so and my wife is busy she has a career so i wanted to be Pretty, pretty busy. Now, I'm not running for anything like politics like uh, Aaron Rodgers or might be, but I, you know, I, I wonder, Aaron, I read an article about him. Didn't he go to a sensory deprivation? Isn't what he does? He goes yeah. into like yeah, he goes two, to like three, four days or weird something. Weird little yeah. like, like a black hole and he <laughs> takes ayahuasca. And like he, I could yeah, imagine I mean, he, he, that. He does a lot of unique things, which is he seems like he's a guy that, you know, either thinks outside the box or is, you know, beats to the you know his own drum type of thing yeah. which is, is fine but i i just like what is the next step like tom brady you know i i still think tom brady is going to be an owner in the nfl but you know is he going to be in the booth all of that type of stuff like you you look at hockey players you know study we know a lot of guys who are retired and they either get into coaching or scouting or now they're working with their own kids like everyone's got their own pathway but I just I'm always curious with a guy like Aaron, you know, Rogers, Brady that are they're so used to the limelight. And then when it goes away, do they do they chase it or do they are they happy kind of just fading into the background? Yeah, well, Brady's going to be in the booth now, right, with Fox as their number yeah. one analyst. And who knows what Rogers does yeah. after his career? I will say, Strutty, the power of overdrive is apparent when it comes to your Google search where you plug in Jason Strudwick. First thing is like Jason Strudwick Twitter, Jason Strudwick NHL, and the fourth or fifth thing that comes up is Jason Strudwick knitting. Knitting? <laughs> knitting. Yeah. So you are synonymous with knitting on <laughs> Google search engines. 
Maybe I'll tweet at Aaron Rodgers about you shouldn't get into knitting, buddy. It's no. good. It's good for the soul. No. It's good for the soul. I put in 20 minutes earlier today, guys. Fingers are a little bit yeah. sensitive. They're a little tired. A nice china white and some knitting. Oh. That is how you conclude a night right there. There's only one kind of yeah. china white, and they're good ones. There's never. I've never had a bad one. Need that nutmeg. Need the nutmeg. We'll talk to Mark oh. Masters, our Maple Leafs reporter. Coming up, this is our number three of Overdrive on TSN 2 and on TSN 1050. Hour three of Overdrive continues. It's brought to you by FanDuel, bringing you everything from the opening line to the final score. Aaron Karolnik in for Brian Hayes, the Jamie Noodles McLennan, and Jason Strudwick. Big news in Leafland today is that Bobby McMahon has a two-year contract extension with the Leafs, 1.35 mil a year. McMahon, the pride of Wainwright, Alberta. Where exactly is yes. that relative to Edmonton, Alberta? A little east, eh? A little east, <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, east, southeast, yes. The, yeah. Down by Lloyd Minister. I mean, it's a, I, I believe, or is that north, Strutty? Well, I think it's, yeah, just basically maybe a little bit northeast, but it's kind of straight to the border towards Saskatchewan from Edmonton, right? To God's country, yeah. they call it. Oh, it must be a, gr- <laughs> a gritty town, Wainwright, Alberta, I imagine. Yeah, yes. there's some probably some grit, <laughs> <laughs> but a it's Dairy great. Queen. Yeah, ma- maybe stuff. a Dairy Queen. Yeah, it's great. It's great for Bobby McMahon. I mean, again, the story is remarkable in that one month ago today, he was slated to be a healthy scratch. John Tavares is sick, misses the game. McMahon slotted into the lineup and scores yeah. a hat trick. And from then on, I mean, it's amazing how and you kind of consider the butterfly effect. Butterfly effect. How one thing that can happen can completely change the fortunes of someone's hockey career. And McMahon has taken the opportunity from then on and really just performed admirably considering all the circumstances. And he scores again on Saturday night against the Montreal Canadiens. He was practicing on the third line today with David Camp and Matthew Nyes, a line that was really effective against Montreal on Saturday. It's a great heartwarming story for McMahon. And the contract is fine. It's not overly onerous as far as what it costs the Toronto Maple Leafs, and for McMahon, it gives them some job security here for the next couple of seasons. Well, it, it does, and and for me, like he's he's come by it honestly. And you're right. A lot of times we talk about it in the NHL all the time. You need opportunity. Like you can work hard, you can you can do and say all the right things, but if you're low on the depth chart, or maybe somebody in the organization doesn't really go to bat for you. You can be a really good AHL player, and then you never get your opportunity, and then you move on to a different organization. Here, he gets an opportunity, and he seizes it. It's basically like some guys get nine lives. First rounders, they've got nine <laughs> lives. They, honest to God, Strutty, you know this. There's guys oh, that there, there's guys that they're drafted really high, and it doesn't matter how crappy they are. It's like that guy deserves ten chances because we put a bunch of money into this guy, and then you've got a seventh rounder, or, <laughs> you know, and 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 they're like, God, this guy, we haven't we haven't invested a lot, and that guy is a late bloomer, and yeah. and they have to go and earn it, and they may get one chance to stick in the NHL. Well, he he got his chance. And he's run with it, and and he's been rewarded with a with a two year deal. Let's see, you know. Hopefully, it doesn't go to his head. Hopefully, he doesn't drop off here. But he seems like a nice player, and I'm happy for him because honestly, about a month ago, me I was thinking this guy's a cold streak away from us never hearing from him again, and that's not the case now. Yeah. But you know, you get your call up to the to the NHL. You have to do what you do best. And then I, I remember my first game. I'm I was coming up there. I was gonna fight. Anybody. I would have taken on Conan the Barbarian. I would have fought anybody at all. The Zamboni driver, the popcorn guy, anyone, just to show people that I cared and to get my name on the on the game sheet. Um and, and you, you you know, that's not for everybody. It doesn't really happen much anymore, but you've got to do what you do best, and that's either bring energy or be physical, block shots, kill penalties, win draw, whatever it is you do, you have to just show the best, but you have to be working towards that. It doesn't just come. You just don't decide and come up here, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. You have to bring it right away, and I think that for this story, it's just like that. But for all the young kids that are out there, you're trying to just find that groove. Do what you do best and be ready for it when you get that chance. Mitch well, Martin. And, and, oh, go ahead, Noodles. So I was just going to say, and one other thing to add on that, AK, is, is keep in mind, everybody who makes it to the NHL, they probably were, were a star at lower <laughs> levels. Yeah, no, honestly. Yeah. Like, you it's think true. about it's it. There's guys who, guys who scored 50 goals in junior – and they get to the NHL and they end up being a checker. 
So you've got to be able to adapt because a lot of times you make it to the NHL, there might be a special player ahead of you, and it's like, okay, we've got a spot on the third line or the fourth line, and, well, I've never checked in my career or I've never done this. So, you know, I was a starter all the way up to the NHL, and then you realize, okay, I, I'm a backup. Like So the league sorts you out. To me, the quicker you can figure out what you are at the National Hockey League level and maximize that, that's where you is going to provide some longevity. Well, our next guest has developed into a star here at TSN. He is the <laughs> yes. Maple Leafs reporter. He is Mark Masters with us here on Overdrive. What's up, Mark? Hey, not much. Just on my way to the airport and going to get to Philadelphia. All right. Well, we appreciate the time this evening. The Bobby mm-hmm. McMahon signing. A two-year deal, $2.7 million, so $1.35 a year. We've been talking about the story February 13th, where Tavares is sick, McMahon slots in, scores the hat trick. I mean, this is a, a real rags-to-riches story here, Mark, that I don't think we can look past. It's a really cool story and, and a really fortunate one for Bobby McMahon. Awesome story. Awesome story. 27-year-old late bloomer, was in the ECHL a couple years ago for a few games. And, uh, yeah, you know, I asked him recently, I asked him, you know, what were you thinking when you were going to be a healthy scratch? And he was saying I was basically took it as a challenge to myself. I wasn't happy that I wasn't a consistent uh, guy in the lineup, and he stayed out late at practice and worked on taking the puck on his backhand, worked on his shot. He's got a great shot. Uh, which he showed off again Saturday in Montreal. And now he really hasn't looked back since that time. I mean, uh, he's not just in the lineup, but he's he's in the top nine. Uh, Sheldon Keefe kind of described him as blossoming, is, is how he put it, uh, in terms of his development in the last little bit when he spoke uh, before the extension was announced during his media session today. So it's a great story for, for a team that needs guys to step up uh, down the lineup and come through on, on cost-effective contracts. Uh, so, Masters, uh, obviously, the, it's a great story with Bobby McMahon. But mm, all right, well, Noodles is out. Should we try, should we try to guess what yeah. he was going to ask, Struddy? What do you think? Uh, I, I think I got it, and I, I'll take <laughs> over. I said, uh, Masters, great to talk yeah. to you. <laughs> yeah. How are the D pairings shaping up? I think that's what Noodles is going to talk I think about. So. Yes. Uh, well, they're, they're shaping up as the same as on Saturday in Montreal. So Brody McCabe, uh, Riley Labushkin, Edmondson, Liljegren. So Benoit still the odd man out. Uh, McCabe missed practice Monday for maintenance, but he, he practiced today. So that's what it's looking like right now. Riley Labushkin, obviously that was what we saw a couple years ago. They, 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 they're comfortable with that. Brody McCabe had a run last year, just kind of a little different because Brody was on the right and McCabe was on the left. So now McCabe's on the right and Brody's mm-hmm. on his natural side where he's played better hockey this year. But that kind of sets you up for, for a pairing that maybe could take on some harder matchups. And then Edmondson and Lilia Grin, uh, Sheldon Keith's made it pretty clear. This is a big moment in Lilia Grin's uh, development. Uh, he's a right shot, which they value. They won in the, in the top six. And he's got to show that, you know, instead of getting pushed out the lineup, like what's happened in the last couple of years after the deadline, he can kind of step up and embrace it. Mitch Marner, or as Struddy likes to call him, Mitch Mariner. Do I have it correct, Struddy? <laughs> yeah. Mariner? Is that yeah, I, I, I think I've called him that a couple of times. <laughs> uh, he it seems quite likely to miss tomorrow night. And this is a guy who's been remarkably durable through his NHL career. I believe this would be his 31st game he's missed in the NHL, Mark. What is exactly he dealing with, and how long-term, if at all, is this prognosis? Well, I guess maybe it's just the time of year, but we haven't gotten much information on this injury. Obviously, we all saw what happened last Thursday in Boston where he missed that chance in the second period, circled the net and seemed to twist his right you know, leg, ankle, whatever it was, uh, in a weird way, he seemed to be discomfort after that, but stayed in the game and finished the game. They did not practice Friday, and then he did not skate in the morning uh, Saturday or play in that game in Montreal, so... Um, you know, they called it a lower body injury. He didn't practice Monday. He wasn't on the ice today. Uh, Sheldon Keefe, uh, is, I don't know, a little weird in answering. He just said, read into that what you will, uh, that he wasn't on the ice today, uh, which is which would mean he's, you know, I'm reading into it that he's not playing tomorrow. I asked him if, if Marner skated at all since the injury, and he said no. So that's a week off the ice for Marner. Um, they've called it day-to-day or said it's going to be day-to-day after missing Thursday, but it's starting to get to the point where you're raising your eyebrows a little bit, just wondering, you know, is this something that he might have to, to manage or are they just being extra cautious 
because they're in a pretty comfortable position in the standings in terms of the playoffs. And obviously, they'd love to try and track down Boston, but it seems seems like that's going to be an uphill battle. So it's it's getting more curious, and they they do have a practice scheduled on Friday, so that will be our next next chance to see if maybe there's an update of some sort. Masters, what approach do you think the Leafs are going to take with getting their both their goalies or a goalie up and running and, and identify who the starter would be for Game 83? Yeah, well, I mean, it's interesting. They're going to go with Samson off tomorrow in Philadelphia. It's the first time since Joseph Wall came back from the high ankle sprain that they're going to start the same goalie in consecutive games. They had been kind of rotating here. Uh, now they, they, you know, they... They approached it last week. They said it was because it was so busy that they were just going to alternate. You know, four games and six nights, we're just going to alternate. We want to get Wool up and running, and we want Samsonov to stay in a group. But Samsonov's won 12 of 14 starts. He's clearly the guy feeling it right now. Wool dropped both games last week uh, against Boston, gave up four goals each time. Perhaps there's some rust there, which would be understandable considering the amount of time he missed. But it seems like right now, you know, they're giving Samsonov a chance to run with it. I imagine, you know, we might be having a different conversation when we get to the to the playoffs. There's still a lot of runway left until we get to that point. Ultimately, it's probably going to be the guy with the hot hand. But right now, that guy is Samsonov, and it seems like they, they want to give him a chance here to run with it a bit. Mark Masters, TSN's Maple Leafs reporter, is our guest here in Hour 3 of Overdrive. John Tavares centering the second line once again, playing with Domi and Nylander in practice today. Do you think that Tavares is the second line center? Is how it's all going to shake out ahead of Game One of the Stanley Cup playoffs? I do feel that way. Um, I, I've kind of felt like that was always going to be the thing, despite the fact they kind of went uh, with this experiment with Tavares as the three C for about ten, eleven games there, and there there was some success, there was some some positives there, but it always felt like it was trending towards these guys getting back together. In fact, Sheldon Keith said that the decision to move Nylander to that second line was was more about giving that uh, that line, getting that line back together, Tavares and Nylander, more so than how poor Nylander and Austin Matthews looked together on Saturday in Montreal. Um, so it's always felt like this was the line at the start of the year, Domi, Tavares, Nylander. It just didn't work out at all. Domi ended up moving to the center on the third line and then got in, got in a bit of a role and in a rhythm, and we, we really hadn't seen them together since then. Obviously, Domi and Nylander had a run to go, together when Domi was the second line center, but... Now it's kind of back to this is what they envisioned at the start of the year. Domi on the wing where maybe he can blow the zone like he did in Montreal Saturday, use his speed to get some breakaway chances. And Tavares and Nylander, obviously we know they've had some chemistry and are very familiar with each other. So I feel like that's what we're going to see. That's what Sheldon Keefe is, is most you know comfortable with and continues to go to. So based on that history, I would expect that's what we'll see in game one. The fourth line with Connor Dewar, is it, is it you know, it's, Give us a sense of who would be on that line as we, you know, kind of move towards what would be the best lineup for the Leafs. Connor Dewar? Uh, the fourth line. What's what's the yeah, best yeah. fourth line version? So uh, they got him with Reeves right now. Those two played together in Minnesota, so there's a baked-in uh, chemistry there. Holmberg on the left side. Uh, it feels like that's your fourth line uh, moving forward here. Noah Gregor, Nick Robertson are the extras at practice. Neither of them uh, have really grabbed on to, to their most recent chance in the lineup. So barring injury, you've got to think, or, or some, some poor play. Reeves has obviously had a good run here. Holmberg, I know, was out for a couple of games when Gregor came in. They didn't like how he played uh, one of the Boston goals uh, in the first Boston game that they had. So, you know, he's always, I'm sure they'll, they'll mix and match guys in down the stretch, make sure everyone's still involved. But it sure feels like the way they have it now with Dewar, uh, Reeves, and Holmberg, could could be the one the, the the lineup we the line we see come game one of the playoffs. Mark, safe travels to Philadelphia. We Thank really you. appreciate your time this evening. Thank you. Yes, Max Domi going into Philly as a Leaf for the first time, and he was sharing some memories of his dad uh, fighting a fan. Oh, <laughs> what a moment! That was at two thousand one, Mark. Yeah, two thousand one, Mark. Two thousand one. So syncs up the the calendar a little bit. So he was having fun reliving that. So this will be his chance to kind of write his own chapter in the Leafs Flyers uh, Philadelphia Memory Bank. Yeah, wow. he, was, he was smiling. He said, I, he didn't remember. He would have been sick when that happened. He said he didn't remember at the time, but he watched the video a couple of times and, of course, <laughs> talked to his dad about it and said, eh, I see it his way. He wasn't going to punch the fan until the fan kind of got into it with the linesman. And the, Ty, Ty Domi was going to stick up for the linesman because they were his buddies <laughs> from, from all the fights he was in. So it was just it was funny to hear him 
talking about it, and he, he loves Philadelphia. Big Bobby Clark fan because he had type he has type one diabetes, just like Clark. That was his idol growing up. So. Uh, kind of cool moment for him going to Philly tomorrow, so I'm excited to see that. Yeah. Although I don't expect any sort of fan kind of jumping into the dropping into the penalty box again. No. I don't think we'll see that again. We're watching it up on TNT. <laughs> yes. oh, so good. This that guy, guy oh, he's that so guy lucky. needed a diaper when he, the, the minute yeah. he fell yeah. through the glass. That guy needed a diaper. So good because. Ty would have stuffed him in a oh, garbage can. That would have yeah. gone so poorly for that yeah. fan. Oh. Yeah, Max said the fan was likely not thinking clearly at the time, is the way he yeah. phrased it. So no I kidding. think we all agree with that. Thank you, so Mark. Good. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. You too. That's Mark Masters, TSN's Maple Leafs reporter. The link, probably the last guy you'd want to be in a very tight, enclosed sure. area with is Ty Domi in 2001. He would just yeah. destroy you quick. Too. That would be very unpleasant. Do you ever drop them with Ty Domi, Strutty? Yeah, I never did. I never did. I, and honestly, we never even really had a like a, even a, a brush. It wasn't even close. And I didn't. I don't. I mean, I, not that I was looking to go and fight him, but it would just. It, you know, usually you have a scrape with a guy after playing many times. But he he had a presence out there, and that was he. You know, he talked a lot, and he was kind of that big. You know, that big presence. But I'll say this about F- Philadelphia people in general: they're some of the most angry people I've ever met. The fans <laughs> there. Uh, after the lockout of four oh five, we we go there. We have the first game back, and it says thank you, fans. Remember they wrote thank you fans on the ice so we yeah. go out for warm-up this is the first game i think ours was the first game coming back and i'm skating around for warm-up i go to stretch uh, around center and all i hear is someone banging on the glass i turned around there's a 10 year old giving me the <laughs> finger and his dad's beside like yeah give it to him give it to him i'm like where where are we and uh yeah. that i will never forget F- philly fans are they they hate everyone. They hate their own team. I think they hate each other. They're an intense <laughs> yeah. group of people. You know what I'm talking about, Noodles. Yeah, it's it's gritty. There's always that guy on the far blue line on on your side that looked like Bozo the Clown. He had the wig and he'd be yeah. yelling at right. you. And like that guy was a clown. But there 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 is for me Philadelphia. They're a passionate fan base, but it is tough to play there. Like they let yeah. you. You have one like bad shift, and people are just giving it to you. Yeah. Like it is a, and that that spectrum was tiny. Like oh. that was a tiny building, and they had a big team. That's when the Legion of Doom was there, Lindros and Renberg right. and Leclerc. Like they they were a serious team, man. That was a scary building to go into. Oh. Like there's not there's no buildings now that have like an aura about them. Like you, you know, there's no Boston Garden, there's right. no Philly Spectrum, Chicago Stadium. Like there, there's no rink where you're like, oh, I'm terrified to go in there. Like even uh, Detroit had the Joe Louis Arena, the big hard boards in the corner, and like there was the odd in Buffalo. They had the guy right. who kicked the the Zamboni door and kicked the puck out to the middle. Like there was all these little unique things about buildings. Nowadays, it's just a multiplex that you show up in, and there's a ton of people in there. Well, do you remember that? I, I never played in the Spectrum as an HLer. I did as an AHLer. And they had a guy named Frank the Animal Biolois. Yes. And this yep. guy, it just, if you have a vision of what he looked, imagine the Tasmanian devil with really long hair. And he was so scary. And this guy would race around. Right? He just, he'd get started and just run you. And the yeah. fans would go crazy. They'd be changing, Frankie, Frankie. <laughs> like, it was, I'm like, where are we right now? Like, can we play yeah. the game? It was scary. Frank the Animal. What I a name. I played with him. We what brought him in. We brought him into what? the Islander. My first, okay, so my first ever game, like, I, I, I was in the AHL, and they sent me to the East Coast League for a weekend, and we played in Roanoke. I was with the Richmond Renegades, okay. <laughs> and there was a guy lined up on the other blue line smashing his head against the his helmet, and it was Frank Jeez. the Animal by Lois. I'm like, yeah. where am I? Am I on, on the moon? And then... A year later, we brought him into training camp, and he showed up to a game in a banana yellow suit. And this guy was like 240 pounds, and he had yes. welts all over his back. And, like, he was just a <laughs> mutant. But he was a nice yeah. enough guy, but a very, very scary human. He's very a, he scary. played three games with the Toronto Maple Leafs. Those were his only NHL games. You look yeah. the rest of his hockey DB page. 
261 penalty minutes, 352 yeah. penalty minutes, 277. He, I, I will say, I don't know. I, it, we got to go, but he, he saved my life, mine and a couple other guys' life, at a bar named Harold's Office at 4 o'clock in the morning in Albany, New York. We, we had a, uh, an exhibition game in Albany, New York, and we ended up going out for a couple beers afterwards. And we ended up at the wrong place, a bar named Harold's Office. And we were not going to get out of that bar if it wasn't for Frank the Animal, because there Frank was a. The we animal. were surrounded by a gang, and oh. Frank the Animal just basically <laughs> took things into his own hands and said, We'll be fine here, folks. He was wearing a banana yellow suit. <laughs> I have so many questions. Surrounded by a gang. That is something we need to expand upon at some point uh, in the not too distant future. Never know. <laughs> <laughs> Frank the Animal by a Lois, a true legend yeah. of hockey. Yeah. Uh, overdrive <laughs> continues here on TSN2, TSN 1050. All right, it's time now for today's best bets. They are powered by FanDuel. Bet on your favorite teams and players on the FanDuel Sportsbook app. In honor of Strutty's appearance on Overdrive, I'm on the Oilers tonight to win by a goal and a half. So minus a goal and a half on the puck line. Shout out to you, Strutty the Oil hosting the Washington Capitals. I like Winnipeg over Nashville. Really like the fit of Tyler Toffoli playing with Iafalo and Sean Monaghan in their first game. And I'm going to take the Toronto Raptors plus three and a half. Emmanuel quickly will play. RJ Barrett will not. I think that is a quality spot for the Raps against a team in Detroit. That should be a very close one considering the relative quality of those two teams. Same game parlays are now available for every NHL game on the FanDuel Sportsbook app. Please play responsibly, 19 plus, and physically located in Ontario. Every night in the NHL here down the stretch is significant because the standings are bunched up in yep. such a crazy way where like you consider Winnipeg here, they are tied with Colorado, two points behind Dallas for first in the Central. And depending on how things shake out, you can really get an advantageous playoff matchup if you finish higher in the standings or lower in the standings. It could be disadvantageous. That's the beauty of what's going on right now in the NHL with all the parity. It's crazy. And, you know, Vegas has got 77 points. Minnesota is six points back. I mean, I don't think they'll catch them. But, you know, think about this. Think if you're the Vancouver Canucks. You have a career season. Unbelievable. And you make the playoffs, and your first-round opponent is the Vegas Golden Knights. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Yeah. Like, you know, some of these matchups and I know people are uh, complaining about the the playoff setups and, you know, should should you go one versus eight? Like, you know, would you like to uh, see them, you know, switched around? I mean, you look at the matchups either way. There's going to be some damn good teams that go home in the first round. That's just how the, it's going to unfold. It's going to be really tough. And I mean, look at the Canucks. I mean, the whole thing with Demko. Um, yeah. You know, that's that I, he will be back for the playoffs, but how long? Like one, the old one to two weeks always makes me a little bit nervous because is it one? Is it two? Is it more than that? So I yeah. think that's a pretty big, a big challenge for them. Uh, and Vegas, like I wonder last night that that late comeback against Seattle, they've been stumbling a little bit. Does that kind of energize them and get them going? And maybe they take a little bit of run up, up, up the standings and, and pass. I think they probably pass Nashville. Then they can, they take over the Kings and that would probably actually yeah. make the Canucks quite happy. <laughs> and then the Oilers wouldn't be happy about it. Think of the Oilers right now are you know, poised to face L.A. or Vegas if they can't keep, catch Vancouver. Now, there might be an outside chance that maybe, you know, what is Edmonton got three games in hand on Vancouver yep. and one head-to-head. -head. That's right. So, Ten points behind, yes. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, you never know. I think it's going to be exciting to see how this finishes. I can't wait. I can't wait. And again, every night in the NHL is very significant. And tomorrow night, the Leafs playing the Philadelphia Flyers. Uh, we're looking forward to that uh, in a major way. It's on TSN. And um, you guys will not be on the show tomorrow, which breaks my heart. But I'll be here with, I believe, Dave Festchuk. Maybe some special guests. I believe James Duthie 
and Carlo Koliakova will be in studio. Oh. So it should be a... Frank the Animal by Lois, maybe? Yeah. Did you see Jonathan? <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Jonathan Crow. Hey, Overdrive, I covered Frank by Lois and the Baby <laughs> Leafs as a TV reporter in St. John's. Real character. Legend has it that he was once a male exotic dancer in Winnipeg. Oh. <laughs> I do believe that I can confirm that because he talked about it. <laughs> that guy is an absolute legend. Frankie the Animal. Wow. He <laughs> needs to have some kind of Netflix documentary about the life and time of Frank the Animal. I, yeah. I interviewed him on in my, my previous show and he, during the during COVID, and I believe he runs like a road crew <laughs> at just outside of Philadelphia, like in New Jersey. And he, he's the nicest guy and he loves it. He's yeah. like, I love it. It's very straightforward. It's still like on a team. And I asked him if he sold his long hair. He said no. <laughs> oh, uh, I guess some things do change. Some things do change. <laughs> Fellas, it's been a blast. Uh, The Raptors and the Detroit Pistons coming up on the other side here on TSN 1050 and up on TSN 4 as well. Uh, Noodles, you'll be back on Friday. Strutty, a blast, man. Great to meet you. Thanks. Likewise, Noodles, look after your uh, neck pillow. (laughs) (laughs) Have a great night in Columbus, Noodles. Tomorrow, 4 o'clock, we'll chat then.